All right, thanks, Dr. Matar, for the introduction. I want to thank Sages for the invitation. I had the great pleasure of following three of the giants of bariatric surgery to talk about uh, how to diagnose GERD after sleep gastrectomy. Um, so, unlike some people out there, uh, like our current president, I do not have any disclosures. So, gastroesophageal reflux disease and obesity. Uh, you know, GERD's basically a constellation of symptoms or complications resulting from the reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus or beyond. And we know that obesity is uh, an independent risk factor. Uh, there's plenty of data that does corroborate that shows an association between increasing body mass index, uh, increasing waist circumference, weight gain, and the presence of symptoms and complications of GERD. Um, as we heard earlier, the, I mean, the, the prevalence is quite high, especially in our population, and those are severely obese, upwards of 50% literature, in addition to 15% of severely obese patients suffering from a symptomatic hiatal hernia as well. So what's the mechanism here between uh, obesity and, and gastroesophageal reflux disease? Well, it's multifactorial. Uh, there's an increased gastroesophageal pressure gradient, uh, as we mentioned earlier, a higher prevalence of hyalur hernias. The basal pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter is uh, lower. Uh, there's also abnormalities, as we talked about, uh, in terms of uh, esophageal motility, uh, with sounds like lots of patients that are actually asymptomatic. Um, there's also hormonal activities, so you know, diet rich in fat. Uh, a high fat intake at a meal will then uh, cause secretion of certain hormones like cholecystokinin and secretin, which will then affect and relax the lower esophageal sphincter. And then the last thing that we sometimes forget about is uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, the prevalence in our population, our patient population, is quite high. And so when someone has an apneic uh, event, their upper airway collapses, you get significant uh, negative intrathoracic pressure, and then you have prolonged uh, nocturnal exposure, acid exposure. So both of the, the pathology here, reflux disease and obesity, uh, have a significant negative impact on uh, the quality of life in addition to association with mor morbidity and mortality. But fortunately, uh, bariatric operations um, are not only just a viable option, they're sometimes the best option to be able to address both of these uh, morbid conditions. However, there's still controversy uh, and a lack of consensus in and around uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease and the sleeve gastrectomy. So kind of a, just quickly, an older study. I know that I'm the, one of the two last people standing between you and happy hour, so I'll try to make this pretty quick. Um, 15 studies, and uh, basically, uh, they, you know, there are about two that had GERD as a primary outcome and 13 with a secondary outcome. And four of the studies showed an increase in reflux after sleeve with seven uh, showing reduction in reflux after sleeve. So conclusion was, like Dr. Gagne said, there's no conclusion, there's no consensus. More recently, in 2016, the OR et al., uh, American Journal of Surgery, they also did a systematic review of sleeve and reflux. Um, they included 33 articles, uh, 20 of eight of which reported on the prevalence of reflux after sleeve, and they showed 16 uh, studies with an increase in reflux after sleeve up to 57.1%, but 12 also showing a decrease in reflux, upwards of 56% reduction. Uh, and of note, uh, 24 studies did report on de novo GERD with an incidence between 0 to 34.9%. So again, because of the high heterogeneity, heterogeneity and the, um, the paradoxical outcomes with the objective esophageal function tests, they concluded that the exact effect of the laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy on the prevalence of GERD is still controversial and remains unanswered. So why does this happen? So in terms of the exacerbation of reflux after sleep, well, some of the thoughts are, out there are going to be an increased intraluminal pressure. Um, there's also decreased gastric compliance. Uh, studies also shown that the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter uh, does decrease. There was a study out of USC that looked at uh, use uh, um, impedance pl uh, planimetry, and they showed that the distensibility happened right after uh, the completion of the sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, anatomically, there's a disruption of the sling fibers. The, col the collar of uh, Helvetius, uh, and can that affect that in terms of the uh, lower soft sphincter pressure? 
And as we mentioned before, the contour of the sleeve. You know, there's, it's not standardized right now. And I would agree, I think people think that the sleeve is an easy operation, but I think it's the most nuanced operation that we need to do. And there's a lot of artistry involved. Um, and so whether you go from two, four, six centimeters from the pylorus, you use a 32 French, 38, 40, bougie, uh, over the staple line, there's so many variabilities to that, and the, the technique is a standardized. What about improvement after reflux, or after a sleeve, in terms of reflux? Uh, well, there's reduction of the acid-producing cells, so in terms of the G and uh, parietal cell mass, that's reduced, which can then be thought to uh, contribute to the reduction of uh, acid production. Uh, gastric emptying is accelerated. Concomitant repair of the hyalur hernia at the time of sleeve gastrectomy. Um, there's also increasing sleeve compliance. Uh, as time goes on, that you know the sleeve may stretch just a little bit against that stable line, and you have a little more compliance, which then relieves some of that reflux. Uh, we're also performing the fundectomy, and the fundus is the source of the relaxation waves to the LES. So performing the fundect fundectomy, we don't have that source anymore. And of course, with the weight loss, we're gonna have significant decrease in uh, intra-abdominal pressure. All these things are uh, contributing to the improvement of reflux after sleeve. So how do we diagnose people, patients uh, with reflux after sleeve? It's no different. The workup is essentially the same as the general population uh, in the post bariatric patient. Um, you know, start with a very good uh, history and uh, clinical presentation. Uh, typical symptoms, heartburn, regurgitation versus atypical symptoms of cough, chest pain, uh, asthma, uh, hoarseness. Um, can start with empiric therapy with a trial of PPI. It's a very um, sensitive test, but not very specific. Uh, but the, the mainstay is going to be the four principal tests of pH, uh, upper endoscopy, uh, manometry, and barium swallow. So starting with pH, uh, you know, we've got a couple of choices in terms of the catheter versus the wireless Bravo. Uh, we all know what uh, uh, is part of the composition of the pH study. And, uh, you know, we can use this because it's considered the gold standard in terms of indications for if the diagnosis of GERD is in question, if a patient has refractory GERD, or if they also have non-erosive reflux disease. This is just a table that uh, shows some of the studies that are reported on 24-hour pH results. And uh, going from the top to bottom, you have Grodner. You had an N of 14 patients, and uh, post-operatively after a sleeve gastrectomy, they had a 102.6% increase uh, in, in the total acid exposure after a sleeve, um, with a 125.4% uh, increase in the Demeester score with, in that population, a 36% uh, de novo reflux. Uh, Burghardt et al., coming down, uh, had a 193% increase in the total acid exposure after sleeve. And then Rebecca down, down below, um, actually showed that there, was gonna, there were two different populations. In the bottom, 28 out of 65 had a pre-existing uh, acid exposure, whereas 37 out of 65 did not. And so the one that had pre-existing actually showed a decrease, 58.8% decrease uh, in that acid exposure versus the ones that did not have the preoperative acid exposure had an increase of only 9.4% and 10.8% de novo. Uh, another study here looking at pH and pH studies where basically only Del Genio showed um, a significant uh, change um, using pH impedance and showed a 60% increase in the total reflux episodes post-sleeve gastrectomy. All right, another modality that's in our armamentarium for, for diagnosing reflux, uh, obviously, is the upper endoscopy, which is a very viable option as it's not only just diagnostic, but can also be therapeutic. And so things that we're looking for are gonna be esophagitis, uh, strictures, Barrett's esophagus, and we're hearing that 15% uh, is, is created after sleeve. Uh, hyalur hernia, and within the literature, it's anywhere between 6 to 63% incidence of due onset esophagitis after sleep gastrectomy. Manometry can also help us, too, in terms of motility of esophagus, uh, the LES and uh, the stomach as well. It can show us things like uh, in increased intragastric pressure with reflux or relaxation of the LES. Busy slide, again, going from red to blue to green, or to yellow. 
Um, the top three are going to show basically uh, a decrease in the LES pressure after sleeve between about 26.1% up to 39.9%. Uh, Rebecca didn't show a significant difference, pretty much the same. And then uh, Peterson, like we mentioned earlier, uh, paradoxically had a 118.2% uh, up to 153.4% increase in LES pressure uh, uh, at eight months follow up. And the last thing that's uh, available to us is going to be a barium, barium esophagram. Uh, this is, helps us to delineate the anatomy post sleeve, and you can look for things like stricture stenosis, hiatal hernia, or the so called neofundus. Um, the slide on the right there is actually a, a patient that I inherited um, who had significant regurgitation and reflux, had a band, band converted to a sleeve. However, the surgeon who performed the sleeve decided to sleeve around the plication and leave that intact. And what it caused was, there was a significant uh, uh, twist or torus kink at the top towards the angle of hiss against the diaphragm, and then with the plication, created a twist as well. So you had a double whammy. And Foley went into this, you know, expecting to do an esophageal jejunospia, but once we took down the plication and then uh, resected the neofundus of the plication and took down a little bit of adhesions, the sleeve was a straight shot. So we were able to, to salvage that, and he's actually done well. And, and, uh, uh, and we know he's doing well because he's one of our employees at our hospital. All right, and so more recent data in 2018, obesity surgery um, out of France, 47 patients, again, using uh, objective uh, uh, studies. They did uh, ambulatory pH monitoring pre-op and at one year after sleeve. And uh, group one, there were 31 that did not have preoperative GERB with group two, 16 of them with preoperative GERB. And so in the, in the first group with uh, no preop GERD, they had an increased time in terms of their pH um, being below four, with 52% of them having de novo GERD. Whereas group two had preoperative GERD, 62% of them reported improvement or resolution, but 38% still did have exacerbation. Oops. So just to kind of pull things together, I just wanted to quickly just go through a patient case, a patient that, um, uh, we share with our thoracic colleagues. Uh, it was a 49-year-old gentleman, and I had a band, band converted to sleeve across the border. Did very well from a weight loss perspective. BMA came down to 28. However, he suffered from severe, severe heartburn regurgitation for years, and kind of just circled around with the gastroenterologist in the community for a little while. And finally got a referral to our thoracic surgeons who um, you know, did a, a very thorough workup. And he was on maximal uh, medical therapy. He was on Nexium like uh, three times a day and with breakthrough symptoms. So he underwent an upper endoscopy, which showed uh, LA grade C, D esophagitis, uh, fortunately no Barrett's, and uh, he had an esophagram, which did confirm a hiatal hernia um, with a slightly dilated sleeve. Uh, the manometer did show a slightly low normal LES with an increased uh, intergastric pressure, but his esophageal motility was intact with his DCI was in the 800s. And he also had a, a Bravo probe uh, which did show significant reflux, but because his esophagitis was so severe, the probe couldn't stay on and just fell off, and so we didn't have the numbers there. So, uh, you know, he had a hiatal hernia repair, conversion to a rheumatic gastric bypass, and he just had his uh, one year, he had a 48-hour pH study with a Jamisa score of four and zero, one day and two, and he's off PPIs. So, um, you know, sleeve gastrectomy is definitely a viable standalone bariatric operation. However, there's still the controversy and the lack of consensus uh, in or around uh, reflux in the sleeve, as we have data to show, you know, it improves it, it uh, exacerbates it, or creates it de novo. Uh, the pathophysiology for, for GERD after sleeve is definitely multifactorial. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, the utility and, and what we have in terms of uh, diagnosing that, it's not going to be much different than, the, you know, diagnosis of a regular re reflux in a general population, clinical presentation, pH, manometry, endoscopy, barrier, and swallow. But we need more, as the gentleman said in, in the question, we need more dedicated studies that objectively evaluate reflux after sleeve. We have to come to, you know, a common definition and use objective studies and, uh, uh, to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much.